Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And we're just going to use one main portion of Scripture this morning as our text. I'll hit some other ones that you can write down. But grab a piece of paper and, and, or rip open an offering envelope, whatever you have to do, and take some notes. I think this is really going to help you this morning. I, I do want to talk about things that you guys are interested in. And so I'm going to talk about why do we go to church? What's the importance of going to church? And why do you guys come, all right? You may have your own reasons, but I'm going to try to tell you a scriptural basis uh, for that about talking about the presence of God. So once you got your Bibles, Isaiah, the sixth chapter, stand, and we're going to make a confession to the Lord this morning together. We do it every Sunday that I preach at least, and uh, we'll make our confession here. It'll be on the screen. Are you ready? Here we go. Today I will open the word of God. May it be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. May it hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now, Lord, I will open my heart to receive from you. I will open my ears to hear from you. I will open my eyes to see the needs of others. Now, I will open my mouth to tell of your goodness. Everybody said amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. 2007, I was invited to go to the PGA Championship here at Southern Hills, Professional Golfers Association. The championship, it was like the Super Bowl of golf, and it was here at Southern Hills, and I was pretty excited to go. All the big names in golf were going to be there. And so I got tickets, and I remember how excited I was. We parked over at ORU and got on a bus, and they drove us over to, to Southern Hills, and we got off the bus, and we started up that ramp. They, they had taken, and, and so you wouldn't crush down the grass, they had built a big walkway out of plywood and carpeted it, so as soon as you got off the bus, there was carpet everywhere. I mean, it was really the coolest thing. And we started walking, and there were crowds of people everywhere, especially right up front. They had the putting greens, the practice greens, and there were people everywhere, and the media was there. They had cameras and everything, and as I walked up, I saw him. There he was, Tiger Woods, right there in front of me. I mean, he was like 300 yards away, and he was right there. No, he was closer than that. He, come on, you guys are going to have to be a little more lively this morning. I'm throwing out some good ones, and everybody, it's just, whew. He was like 50 yards away from me. There he was, Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer of all time. I mean, the competitive, the man, I mean, just unbelievable. The man, I've always wanted, I've watched him on television, I've always wanted to see him, and there he was in living color right there in front of me. He was putting, and everybody was around him taking pictures. He was there. And I watched him the whole day. We followed him around, and he was like not in it most of the game, you know? I mean, it was just, it was awesome to just be there and see Tiger Wood and Phil Mickelson and all those guys. But you know what, here's the thing. When I left there that day, nothing had changed for me. I saw some really cool people. I saw some guys that I watched on television, but nothing changed. I was still the same person. I had a few souvenirs. I was a little more sunburned, but I saw Tiger Wood. I didn't get to touch him, but I saw him. But he didn't change my life. He didn't change my life. Being there with him didn't make any difference to me. It was cool, but it didn't do anything to me. It didn't, I, I didn't feel like a better person when I walked away. Nothing happened internally, spiritually, metaphysically. Nothing happened to change or alter my course of life. I saw him. It was cool. I got some pictures. I left. End of story. That's the way it is when we are around mortal things on this earth. But when we come to church, we come into the presence of God. God is here, and when we walk into this place, we have an encounter with God. We open up our hearts to God, and something happens in his presence that can't happen when we're at home. It can't happen on a golf course. It can't happen in a boardroom. It can't happen anywhere else. It can't happen in a bar or in a club. What we experience here happens only at church because we're in the presence of God and we're with other people who are worshiping God. Tiger Woods never changed my life, but Jesus Christ did. So when we come together, we come into his presence. And I just, I believe with all my heart that there is something special that happens when the people of God come together. Now, 
I have brought up in church all my life. I mean, really, I really, I've been brought up in church all my life. I can remember when we had, when we were in Norman and we had started a church down there and I mean, we didn't have family, hardly anybody. It was just us. And I can remember one Sunday morning we got up and I preached, did the worship. Lisa did the Sunday school and, and did the kids stuff and all that. So it was us. We had to unload the trailer and set everything up. I mean, that's just the way it was. We had a few people helping, but we were the show. And Callie woke up and she was sick. She was throwing up sick that morning. What can we do? We can't just call in and call people, hey, we're not going to show up this morning. We got a sick kid. So we're just going to cancel church this morning. Okay, just let that fall where it might. But you know, that's what we couldn't do it. And so we just decided we've got to bring her with us. So we brought her with us. And we at the time were meeting in a hotel uh, there right on I-35. And so we asked the people behind the counter if they would watch her. And so she went and laid down on the couch in their office. And we did service and came back every once in a while. That's just, we grew up in church. We grew up going to church. My dad was a pastor. My grandfather pastored until he was 100 years old. It's all we've ever known. And if we're not careful, the more we go to church, the less we think of it, the more we think of ourselves. The more we think of this process that we go, we come and it's all contingent upon the music or the sound or the atmosphere. That's what does it. I want you to know something. What's sung in, in worship, what happens with the sound system, if the lights work, if you got good parking, if you got good coffee, that has no bearing on what happens in the service. When we get into the presence of God, everything changes not because we've got good music or because we've got a good speaker. It's because the presence of God has rested upon the place that we're here. How do I know that? Because I've been to some places where they didn't have that kind of stuff. I've done some camps and I've been in some, some situations where you didn't have all that, but the presence of God came and touched lives and transformed people. I want you to know that. The power of God is what changes the lives of people. And the power of God is sensed and realized most relevantly and frequently in the presence of other Christians in a church setting. That's the way God set it up and that's the channel that he uses to touch the lives of people. Amen? So let me throw some scriptures at you real quickly before we get to our main scripture. Matthew 18, 20, you can just jot these references down and you can go back and look at them. Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. God set it up that way where people are gathered together in his name that he's there in the midst of them. Acts 4, 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. When they got together and began to worship and pray together, God met them. Acts 2, when the people were in the upper room, the, the, the disciples, the 120 were in the upper room, the scripture says they were all in one accord. That meant they were all together with one purpose. They were together with each other. They were together worshiping God, and God's presence came down. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them at that time. There's something that happens when God's people get together. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy, the New King James Version says. Acts 319, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. So we see these scriptures that let us know that it's the presence of God that brings refreshing. So why do we go to church? What's the purpose of us coming together and meeting here? We come because we are in the presence of God with other believers who we can worship with. Well, pastor, I can stay at home and experience the presence of God. You might be able to on occasion. I understand that. God's presence is everywhere. I understand that. But he designed it for the last 2,000 years that when people get together, Together and they begin to call upon his name and worship him and sing and break bread together and worship and open the word of God that he sends down his presence to dwell upon them and minister to them. That's what happens when we come to church. So some of you say, well, pastor, I just don't feel it all the time. There are just times when I don't feel it. I, don't, I come to church and it just doesn't seem like anything happens. I, I, I'm at home and I just think, I just don't have the energy to go. I've had a busy day. Some of us, if we're just honest with ourselves, and I gotta say, sometimes there's just not that longing to be in God's presence. There's not that longing. I mean, 
I can watch it on television. I can watch T.D. Jakes, and, and they jump around, and they do all kinds of, and I can listen to that and feel God's presence. I understand where you're coming from with that, because I can watch those things too, and there are times that I can feel the presence. But the transformation that God has for our lives comes when we get together. Christianity was never meant to be spent alone in isolation in front of a television. Come on, can you guys, can some of you just risk an amen? Can you? The Christian life was meant to be spent with other believers who are struggling like we are, who are going through the same things, who I may not be able to sing, but I can get other people to get up and they can worship and they can sing the way I never could. I might not be able to speak, but I can get other people around me who I can hear their message and I can hear their voice and it inspires me. And then when I have needs in my life, I have other people who can surround me and come up and who can pray for me. When I'm down, someone else is gonna be up. When I'm up, I can reach out to someone else who's down. We are the community of believers. We are the people that when we come together, God is here in our midst. It's important that we as God's people come and worship him together. So here's what I'm gonna tell you. I want to give you this morning, when a church comes together, three things that happen. When people come together, three things that happen. You can write these things down. I'm pulling all of them from Isaiah, the sixth chapter. Turn with me if you, already, if you haven't already. Turn to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. I want you to look right here at the first part of that, starting at the first verse. It says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Okay, we understand right there that that this is Isaiah speaking. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was in the temple. He came to worship. That's what it's saying here. Above him were seraphim, just uh, another word for big angels, (laughs) and with uh, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces, and with two wings, they covered their feet, and two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Wow! Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, when you get together and you begin to worship God and all of a sudden the place begins to shake and it's filled with smoke. I mean, they didn't even have, you know, like smoke machines back then. I mean, that, so we don't know, was this, what, what was this? I mean, Isaiah, was this like, uh, you know, did he have a little too much to, you know, we don't know. We don't know if it was literal or if it was figurative. We don't know. What we do know is that something happened. He had some experience. He had an experience here. So let me give you three things this morning that I think that we need to understand when we come into the presence of God. Number one, the first thing we have to understand is how big God is. We have to understand how big God is. God is so big that when we worship him, he has the ability to shape things and bring smoke. God is the creator of the universe. Here in this story, it's kind of an interesting story. If we get into Uzziah's life, we find out that he was a king, and, and he, he was a king of Israel, and he was, he was very well loved, and he honored God. Scripture says he did good, or he did righteously in, in, in the, the eyes of, of God as his father had done. Man, he established uh, places of worship. He tore down altars and, and he, he brought righteousness to Israel. He honored God in all that he did. And Israel enjoyed years of prosperity and blessing because their king was following God. But as time went by in, in Uzziah's life, he began, he, he began to get accustomed to the presence of God. He, he began to take advantage of it. He began to believe that it was his abilities and his talents that was really bringing in the presence of God. In fact, it got to a point where he decided that he was going to overrun what the priests were supposed to do. The priests would come into the temple and they would begin to light offerings and give incense to God and worship God. And Uzziah decided that he was going to do that. He needed something done and he wasn't going to wait on them. So he came in and he began to do the incense to God. And the priest came in and said, King, you can't do this. This is against the laws that God has given us. You, you can't do this. And basically Uzziah was like, I can do anything I want. I'm the king. 
I don't have to worry about you guys. I don't need you guys. I can do it all myself. And as he was speaking the scripture, and you can look it up in 2 Chronicles, the 26th chapter, as he was speaking, leprosy began to break out on his forehead as he was speaking. Could you imagine those priest's eyes about that big? Okay, here's our king who has done a great job, but he decides that I don't need the presence of God. I can do this all myself. Listen, if the presence of God was man's ability or man's doing, we wouldn't need God to come down and do it because it would be man who's doing it. The problem is, is that God's presence and God's anointing would be subject to the fickle nature of man. Sometimes I feel like it, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm in tune, sometimes I'm not. And if I come and I don't feel the presence of God or I don't feel like doing a certain thing or I don't like the way they do that, you guys are out of luck. You just have to sit there and lump it because I've decided that the presence of God isn't gonna come. Let me tell you, the presence of God isn't subject to man's desire or what man wants. The presence of God is something that God does. God can come down and wreck a service and completely push the pastor out of the way. He didn't need me. He didn't need me. But when we come together, it's God's presence that's here. And so we see the scriptures, they go on, and we find out that, that not only was he now had leprosy, but he was banned from the temple. He was banned from the presence of God because if you had that uncleanness, you had to be put out, away from your family, and live in exile. And he lived in exile the rest of his life and finally died a man because he had made a mistake, because he had chosen to overrun the authority of God and the power and the presence of God. Can I tell you, that ought to send shivers down every one of your spines when you see God do something like this to someone because of choices that they made. And what is our excuse? We are sinners saved by grace. The only excuse, the only justification that we can come up with is that we have a great big God who has a plan and he is bigger than anything I can imagine. And when I come into his presence, I come to worship the biggest, greatest God of the universe. He is a great God. And so Isaiah comes and he begins to worship God and, and he understands, listen, the king is gone. So what do I do? I come in here and the king is gone. I have no king. I have no one to lead me. But here's the thing that he has to understand. Church is not about a speaker. Church is about the Savior. Church isn't about coming and hearing the speaker. It's coming about hearing the Savior and experiencing Jesus Christ in our lives. And so when, when, when Isaiah began to worship when he began to worship God, the king's not there. The pastor, the leader's not there. But when he came to worship God, God revealed to him something. It's not about the pastor. It's not about the king. It's not about the leader. It's about you coming and opening up your life and allowing the presence of God. And the presence of God came in and began to shake the rafters and smoke filled the place as he felt the presence of God come in. It's not about man. It's all about God. It's not about man. It's all about God. When we come, it's for a divine purpose. We come come to worship God. We come to worship God, and God resides here among us. And let me tell you, if it wasn't such a big deal, the devil wouldn't fight you so much to not come to church. Isn't that the truth? Isn't it amazing your kids only get sick on Sunday mornings? Isn't it amazing that you only get in those big blowout fights with your wife on Saturday night or Sunday mornings? I mean, sometimes, you know, on the way to church, I can remember when we were, when our kids were small, on the way to church, Lisa would make me mad. She'd say something, make me mad. I'd be rude to my wife. I'd spank three or four of my kids in the car before we got to church. I mean, just ever, all hell would break loose on the way to church. Why? Because the enemy knows that if he can get your mind on something else, if he can get your attention going somewhere else, he'll captivate you that whole service. If he can make you mad at someone who's in the church, if he can get you upset because someone's in your seat, or someone's here or someone's not here, what does she mean by that? What did he mean by that? How come the drummer's too loud? How come this is happening and the lights aren't right? Whatever. And we get all sidetracked about that kind of stuff. And we start thinking it's all up to us. It's not up to us, lest we be cast with leprosy. It's up to God. And he is a mighty God. And I come into his presence. And I have to understand sometimes, hey, when it becomes Sunday, Saturday, and Sunday, I got to get focused. And I'm not going to let anything get in my way. I don't take phone calls on Sunday morning because I don't know what they're going to be. Sometimes I don't even take them on Saturday nights because I don't know what's going on. I want to be isolated and focused on what God's doing so I can get ready and prepare my heart for what God has for me on Sunday morning. Folks, 
We've got to do that. You as the people of God, you have to focus in and understand that church is the place where we come and get something from God. Don't let any demon in hell take that away from you. Be vigilant, be strong. Second thing is this, realize how small we are. Okay, first we realize how big God is. Next we realize how small we are. Here's what Isaiah did, verse number five. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, he says. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Almighty Lord. He's saying, listen, I got a glimpse of how big God is, and what that did in me was let me understand how small I am. I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner saved by grace. Lord, have mercy on me, your servant, because I am not perfect. When I see your holiness and when I have a glimpse of who you are, it helps me understand how small I am and where I am in the scope of things. You are the God of the universe. You are the one who's controlling it. For me to think that just because I showed up that that church is lucky to have me and I'm bringing in the presence of God is arrogance on my part and is something that God will deal with me about. But what we do is that we come in and understand that it is the greatest honor, the greatest privilege that we have to come in and lift our hands and sing praises to the king of the universe, the one who created everything, the the, the Lord, the captain of the armies of of God, the Lord of hosts is what they call him. He He is the captain of the guard. He is the leader of the universe. He is the one who has the power and the authority and all love and all wisdom and all knowledge. He is the one that I have an audience with this morning. And when I stop and pray, he stops everything that he's doing and listens to what I have to say because he is so in love and in tune to me. That's the God that we serve. We understand how great he is and how small I am. Are you guys with me this morning? Three things that Isaiah saw. I want you to write these down. Three things Isaiah saw. We've got them here, up here on the screen. First thing is he saw himself. He saw himself. Isaiah saw himself. After Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw himself. He looked and saw how great God was, and automatically he looked at himself and says, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. That's the first thing we have to do. When we understand who God is, then we have to look at ourselves. God, what is it in me? Reveal in me, look inside of me, help me deal with the things who I am. Number two is he saw his problems. He saw the things that were around him. He saw the situations of life. Verse number five says, he is the Lord Almighty. He's the Lord of hosts. He understood that my problems are so great, I need a savior. I need the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven to come in. The idea here is not just how small I am, but the idea here is how small my problems are compared to the greatness of God. How small my situation is compared to the greatness of what God has for my life and who he is and what his abilities are. When I look at that, it puts everything into, into to focus for me. I saw a great quote here. We got a little picture up on the screen that I thought was kind of funny. Don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. Amen. Quit worrying about the situations of life. There's very few things that we can control in life anyway. We have to put those in the hands of Christ and let, ha- and let Christ take care of those situations. And number three is he saw his sin. He saw himself, he saw his problems, and he saw, him sin. He saw his sin. Look here in verse number three. The seraphim, as they were worshiping, they began to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When we see the holiness of God, it reveals the sin inside of us. When we see the holiness of God, it reveals the sin inside of us. When I see that he is a holy and a perfect God who is righteous in all he does, it helps me understand the sinfulness of my heart and where I am coming from. And I desperately need that savior to come help me in those situations of my life. When I was a young man, one of my most frequent prayers before I got up to do music or to get up to, to, to worship or to get up to speak was, Lord, put me behind the cross and let them see you through me. Put me behind the cross, Lord. Put me behind the cross. Don't let me be in front of the cross because I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you. And at that young age, I didn't even fully understand what it means and I probably don't even fully understand what it means today. 
But what it does mean to me is that I have to be behind the cross and let people see the cross he is, the, the cross of Christ. Christ is the focus of our lives. Christ is the one. He is the example. He is the prism that we see the world. He is the example of the love of Christ, or the love of God. The love of God is explained through the death of Christ. The hope of the world is through Christ. Any situation that we're dealing through can be solved through the focus of Christ. If we'll apply Christ to our lives and allow him to do it, he will change our lives. Last thing, not only do we see how big God is and how small we are, but the last one is that we see how good God is. We see how big God is, we see how small we are, and then where that leads to is how good God is, the goodness of God. Look at verses six and verses seven in this portion of scripture. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin purged. Or some scriptures say, your sin atoned for. That, that word purge, the, the original word there, uh, the, original, uh, the original Hebrew word there actually means atoned for, atonement. I know that's a big spiritual word that some of you guys don't understand. Atonement, atonement. It means at one, A-T, at, at one, at one meant. Atonement, atone, at one. It means at one with God. He has purged my sin. He has made me at one with him. He has brought me into his fellowship. Isaiah saw this seraphim come and take these coals and put it on his lips and say, now your sins have been revealed. Your sins you have been atoned for. It's a symbol of who Christ was. It, was. it was foreshadowing of the message of Christ to the world. When I come to God and I understand how great he is and I understand how small I am in this world, the next thing is I, I come to understand the goodness of God, that he has forgiven me, that he has cleansed me, that he has brought his redemption to my life he has provided a way through Christ for me to have eternal life and for me to walk in the faithfulness and the righteousness that he has for every one of our lives. That's great news for us. Why? Because he provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. God does something for us in his presence that we could never do on our own. <laughs> Let me say that again. God does something in his presence that we could never do on our own. He removes the sin from our lives. He brings conviction to us and he cleanses us. Psalms 103, the 12th chapter, the 12th verse says, as far as the east is from the west, he has removed his, our transgressions from us. When we come into his presence and we see how big he is and we see how small we are and we experience his goodness and his goodness is his forgiveness forgiveness, his grace, his mercy through Jesus Christ. He takes away our sin. He takes away our mistakes. Now listen, folks, you got to understand this. Before you can ever get to point three, you got to go through point two. You can't be like Uzziah and never hit point two. You can't go from the goodness of God or the greatness of God to his goodness before you have to go through who I am as a person. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am a mess up. I have made mistakes in my life. Even the most righteous of us, even the best of us have things that we don't want to talk about, the things that we don't want other people to know. The good news is, is that Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross, paid the price for my sin so that those sins could be washed away and I can stand in righteousness before God because of the love of Christ and the blood of Christ for my life. That's the good news of what the gospel is. That's what happens here at church. My sins are forgiven. Your sin is no shock to God. Your sin is no shock to God. His, his standards are pretty low. His expectations of you are pretty low. Sorry to burst your bubble, but his expectations of you are pretty low. Why? Because we could never even get up to what his expectations are. We are sinners saved by grace. But the only way that he even can allow us to step into his presence 
is because when we come under the forgiveness of Christ, he sees us with the blood of Christ and as we stand before him, he sees us with the seal of Christ as if his son was standing there and his face lights up and he sees us as the righteousness of Christ. Ah, praise the Lord. Y'all, do you feel, do you, do you, do you, do you, grasp, do you grasp that? I, okay, this is maybe just something that God's bringing to light in my life. I, he, he's just, it really is. I, I mean, my dad has taught me stuff all my life. I've sat in his ministry all my life. I've heard these things. I've heard these things. I've heard these things. But he is just beginning to make this come alive in my life. He's exploding this in my life. I got up early this morning, and as the sun came up, I've got another one of those prisms. You're going to get tired of my prisms. I got another one of those prisms, and I hang it in the window of my office. And as the sun comes in, it's, it's faced in the east. As the sun comes in, I turn and look on the wall, and there's these rainbows of prisms all over my dead deer heads on the wall. <laughs> it, is so, it is so beautiful. There, there's this prism of rainbow that hit all over the place. The rainbow isn't a negative sign for me. The rainbow doesn't represent my sexual orientation. The rainbow to me represents God's promise and it represents the people of God. He loves everyone. His love, when it comes, the, the, the light as it comes through that prism and shines into my office and shines into my car, wherever I'm at, represents the love of Christ that knows no color. It, it reaches every color. It reaches every person. It reaches everywhere. That's the love of Christ. That's what God is just beginning to show me in my life. I heard the story, Robert Morris pastor at Gateway Church down in, in South Lake, Texas, tells the story of a man who was a mentor of his named Milt Green. Milton Green was a, was a businessman in, in, down in the Dallas area. He owned, uh, he had a carpet cleaning business. He had some other businesses, but he was just a, a blue collar guy that just had an experience with God and it transformed him. And, and his Southern Texas twang, he loved to preach and tell people about the goodness of God. And, and really, it transformed a lot of ministers, James Robertson and different ones down there. He really had an impact on their lives. Milt Green tells the story about he had this carpet cleaning business and he would hire these young men to come and do carpet cleaning for them and some of them would get it and some of them just wouldn't. And he went and he got this guy going on a job and he, was, he showed him what all to do and he was doing the house and Milt took off to go get somebody else going on something else and he was gonna come back and check on the guy. When he came back, uh, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes later or whatever, the guy's loading his stuff up and Milt thought, uh-oh, this is a problem because it should have taken him longer to do this big old house in just 30 minutes. So he went in and he began to look around and sure enough, he went into those traffic areas like the hallway and the, and the, the living room where the couches were and he looked down and there was still, the carpets were still dirty, he could tell. So he called the young man and says, come in here, I wanna show you something. And he came in and he, he took that kid and he positioned him where his toes were right on those pathways, right on the pathway. And he stood in front of me, he says, okay, young man, look at me. And he says, now look right down there. He looked down there, he goes, what do you see? And the kid says, uh, it's dirt. I still see dirt in the carpet. And he, Milt said, fantastic. I can work with you. I can work with you. Because you see the dirt. You don't know how many guys that I say look at me and look down and they don't see it. But you can see it. We can work together. And he says, I want you to go back. And he cleaned all that stuff up. Robert Moore said, I'll never forget that illustration because it spoke so much to my life. Because listen, before we can ever see the dirt in our life, we first have to focus on the Lord. Amen. And when we focus on God and we can see the dirt in our life, God says, I can work with that. If you don't understand where you're at spiritually, if you don't understand that you are a sinner saved by grace, if you don't understand that all of us, all of us have sin, all of us come to Christ. All of us need a savior. If we don't come to that point, you can never experience the goodness and the freedom of God. You'll always walk around thinking, hey, I'm better than most. 
when it's not better than most because we can never be good enough, the only way that we get to heaven and the only way we get forgiveness and the only way we find salvation is to understand our sin, ask God to clean it, and experience the goodness that God has for our lives. That's what God wants for you this morning. He wants you to understand how great he is, how small we are, and how good he is for our lives. Bow your heads with me. Would you-